everyone, hope you're doing well. This is The Deep Dive. I'm here with our Senior Wealth Advisor, John Creekmer, and my name is Drew Creekmer. And today we're going to be talking about the debt ceiling, and then we're going to be reviewing an upcoming trade that we have in our clients' accounts, uh, rationale behind it, what we've seen over the last six months, and the reasons why uh, we are placing the trades that we are. But before we hop into that, John, how are you doing? Hey, doing well, and uh, really had a great start to the year and uh, a lot of different ways. And I know we encourage everyone to develop a personal growth plan and uh, heard some great feedback from clients on things they're focusing on this year as far as in their personal decisions. And uh, that's always encouraging to hear because we know we're not talking just about money, uh, but it's about living the most incredible life you can live. And one of those aspects about that is improving ourselves every day. And so just as we try to improve our processes and the things that we do, on managing portfolios and getting to high quality decisions. Uh, I know individually we're all working on things to improve our health, improve our relationships, uh, just kind of even improve our stress levels. And so great job for everyone doing those things and uh, looking forward to seeing what the rest of the year has to hold. Yeah, absolutely. And it was awesome as well to receive all of the uh, updates about what you guys did over the holidays, get some pictures as well. That was really cool. So we appreciate all who sent those in. And uh, anytime you do something cool, we would love to hear from you. So don't hesitate to reach out and uh, let us know what you're up to. So, John, let's hop into it. You know, this one of the biggest things we're hearing from clients is questions about the debt ceiling. Uh, we know that we, the debt ceiling needs to be increased in Congress and be signed off on by the president. Obviously, with the current co construction of the U.S. government, um, there is potential for this to be a long and drawn out and very uh, politically adverse situation. And so uh, we've done a lot of research on this. We've experienced this in the past. And so we have a pretty fair idea of where this thing may go, but why don't you just high level it for us, what exactly is going on with the debt ceiling and what are we watching here? Yeah, so if you've ever seen the U.S. national debt clock, and maybe it would be a link we could put in here uh, for people to see it on the website, it actually measures the national debt every single second. Um, and so we're over $31 trillion and it's, it's growing rapidly. It's going a rapid uh, ascent actually over the last five years. And we know it's not a good thing. It's not sustainable for it to be going up. And uh, we know we're going to be at 31.3 trillion uh, coming up here in the next couple of months. And so whenever that happens, that affects a lot of us. And the reality is um, the debt level is not really the main issue. The main issue is federal government overspending. And so whenever I know a huge debate right now is, well, where do we cut spending? And there's some that are saying we don't need to cut spending anywhere. We can just take on more debt. That's more of what's called a Keynesian economic philosophy or principle and a lot of countries in the world operate on the Keynesian philosophy which says that the government spending actually is what drives the global economy uh, we do not agree with that uh, we do know the inputs from the government are really impactful so a question is it's not just to cut spending for the sake of cutting spending but to cover unnecessary spending or is spending which is really out of whack with what real pricing is and so uh, that's an issue that will be the debate going on in the next couple of months as they're really trying to figure out a solution as far as on the debt. But a couple of things to think through um, over the next 30 years, we believe that this from the CBO research and reports that we're looking at is that entitlements such as Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all of their health care programs, they're going to rise from 10.7 percent of the gross domestic product to 15.1 percent of the gross domestic product. We also know with interest rates having gone up, the interest paid on the national debt's also gonna be increasing. And it's gonna be increasing at a pace of about 20% higher this year than last year. And so we know those level of increases are not sustainable long-term without increasing the debt that we have. And so it's a matter of saying, are there areas in which we are spending inefficiently? And what are some ways in which the federal government can decrease spending? However, it does have a long-term impact overall on our economy. Yeah, it definitely does. And it also impacts taxes. I know that's something we talked about a lot with all of our clients, John, um, mm -hmm. that we have a window here for the next couple of years where taxes will be lower. Um, and so you can do some pretty advanced tax planning to save yourself money in the long run because taxes are going up uh, after the 2026 tax year. And with where we're at from a national debt standpoint, um, that is one of the things, levers, that the U.S. government can pull to increase revenue to them to help service that debt. Now, a lot of people have said, hey, there's, there's, we all know there's two possible outcomes. We either reach a deal or we don't. Mm. Um, with what we've seen in the past, a deal is usually reached, but it comes down to the wire. Um, and if a deal is not reached, the U.S. Treasury does have enough funds in place to fund the government's operations for a period of time. And so, John, what are we 
tracking? What are the probabilities that we're looking at in terms of a deal being reached before the deadline? Um, and really, is there anything that we need to be super concerned about or aware of as we get closer to that deadline? Yeah, so we know that a deal, it's a very high degree of probability it will be reached. Uh, some of the things to be aware of is that uh, typically when you see a split Congress, that's really good because there's gridlock along the way. And so the sides have to work together to reach a solution. Um, in this case here, we have two very narrow majorities with the Senate um, on the Democratic side having a very, very narrow majority of one. And we also know on the Republican side of the House, a very narrow majority there. And even within the own parties, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, whenever it's a very narrow lead of one party over to the other, well, then sometimes some of the more extreme subunits within each party has a higher level of control. So as an example, in the Republican Party, we know as far as electing the Speaker of the House, that a group of 12 Republicans had a outsized level of influence in selecting the Speaker of the House and having demands for things to happen within the House. Whether we agree or don't agree, um, that's really up for debate and discussion later on. However, we do know that the same situation is going to come into play as far as with the ultimate resolution on the debt ceiling. And then we could possibly see some additional negotiation to decrease spending across the board. Now, I think there's a renewed commitment from both sides of the aisle to not touch or decrease the social programs, which would be Social Security. It would also be things such as Medicare and Medicaid. However, there's a lot of other spending areas. We know over 90% of the budget is, is concentrated in other areas. And so we look for ways for them to work together to get to a solution. And it may actually go through with a little bit more decrease overall in spending or at least frivolous spending uh, moving forward in this budget resolution. However, we do anticipate it will come down to the wire um, and it will possibly be one of these 12 o'clock midnight votes uh, before it's actually passed. Yeah, yeah. So we'll keep an eye on that. If there's any updates, we'll definitely keep you in the loop as to what we're watching for and what it means for you and your overall financial goals. John, let's kind of shift gears here. You know, in this email that you're all receiving, there is a video from your advisor talking about some trades that were recently placed in our clients' accounts. And so in today's deep dive, we're gonna talk big picture about just the overall investment process that we've really been spending a ton of time working on and fine tuning over the last number of years. Um, and as well as some of the things we're seeing that really influenced the trades that we made in our clients' accounts. And so John, let's just start big picture. Yeah. You know, what are what's at the core of our investment process? You know, there's two fields of investing. There's fundamental analysis or fundamental investing, and there's technical analysis. And one of the things we've always talked about with all of our clients is that you do not want to get married to one viewpoint and not be able to deviate because nothing in this world is finite. Um, there are very few things. Should just say nothing. There are very few things. And so when it comes to investing, that is incredibly true. So how do we fuse those two areas of investing into our process? Yeah, so we have two main areas. We have a fundamental analysis and we have a technical analysis. And then on the top of that, as far as with your overall investment philosophy, you could have more of a passive investment philosophy, or you could have more of an active investment philosophy. We believe big picture, we need to look at all four of those areas. And so a passive investment philosophy would simply say, hey, we're going to select a number of investments to be diversified, and we're simply going to hold those for a long period of time. An active strategy says that we're going to look for quality investments. However, we recognize as the economy changes, as the global economy changes, as the political leaders change, and as different companies change through innovation, that there may be different winners and losers in different seasons. And so we're going to be more active in the approach. Now, this would not be like a daily making trades willy nilly. However, it's about saying, are there larger trends that we need to take advantage of? Now, as far as analysis, there's two main types of analysis, a fundamental analysis and a technical analysis. And we're analyzing two different areas. Fundamental looks, let's say, with a company, an individual company. That really is looking to say, what is their balance sheet like? What is the debt they have? What is the cash level they have? What is their revenues? Are their sales increasing? At what percentage are they decreasing? Um, how much debt do they have relative to their um, daily or monthly expenses? We're also looking at things such as profitability. And so that's the fundamental analysis of an individual company, or you could say a fundamental analysis of a mutual fund or exchange traded fund, which says fundamentally, how are these investments doing relative to their peers? Technical analysis though, really looks to say, we don't care specifically about those items. What we're looking at is, 
what is the daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annually movement of each individual investment that we're looking at? And so this individual stock that we're looking at, um, is it moving up and down? At what pace is it moving up and down? Uh, how is it moving up and down relative in strength to other comparable investments that we're trying to benchmark against? But also we're looking at things such as what is the daily moving average of an individual stock or exchange traded fund or a sector fund. So what that would mean is that every single day you look at the closing price of the underlying investment, let's say Caterpillar, or we could say a mutual fund, um, ABC mutual fund. You look at the closing price every single day for five days, you add those five up, divide by five, that's what's called a five day moving average. But we create that for a five day, for a 20 day, a 50 day, a 100 day and a 200 day. Whenever we look to see what is the most recent movement in the last five days or 20 days, or for us, where we're looking at the 50 day moving average in relation to its long term movement, the 200 day moving average. And if we see the 50 day is going down and it crosses the 200 day on the way down, that's called a death cross. And that means that historically that holding will continue moving down. However, if we see the 50 day is increasing and it passes through the 200 day, that's called a golden cross. And in that case, historically, that investment or position continues moving in an upward fashion above that 200 day moving average until something changes within the system. So whenever we look at portfolios, we want to consider both the fundamental, make sure we're investing in quality companies, quality exchange traded funds and quality mutual funds. And we also look at the technical. How is that particular investment performing recently against a comparable investment? Yeah, I think that's a great summary of it. And John, let's kind of drill down into the changes that we made recently. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the technical side first. And so you talked about the golden cross, which is the 50 day moving above the 200 day. Uh, so far, we're getting very close after this really strong start to 2023 to the broad base markets, the S&P 500, NASDAQ. We're getting very close to seeing the 50 day move above the 200 day moving average, which would be a very good thing. Um, however, you know, we are recording this right before the Fed announcement, so we will see what the reaction is to that. And when we look at the fundamental side as it relates to the broad market, um, you know, we're seeing companies are starting to lay people off. They're being more conservative in their projections for the rest of the year. And it seems to be that the economy in general is slowing in large part due to some of the actions the Federal Reserve is taking to bring down inflation. And so the technicals are confirming both the fundamental side of things and giving us a really good idea of when or if we really want to fully enter the market. Mm. And one of the reasons over the last six months we've seen very strong outperformance relative to the broad based market is because we've been holding funds in cash or in very conservative bond funds that are paying a nice yield. Um, and so what we're really tracking is to see will the technicals confirm the market is going to move up for an extended period of time. And we're very close to that point. When we look at some of the sector funds that we're purchasing today, on the fundamental side, there are what is called value funds. And John, can you kind of talk about value versus growth? What does that mean? And why are we in value funds right now? Yeah, so a lot of the holdings on this trade, when you think about it, there are in the value position um, or value industries um, or with value companies um, versus growth. So a difference in the two would be value would say these are companies that have a strong cash position. Fund this is a fundamental analysis. So a strong cash position. Historically, they pay a dividend and that dividend is growing. They have a very low debt position. They have a strong earnings and those earnings are consistent from year to year. However, they're listed as value because the price per share is low relative to other companies versus their earnings per share. And so in other words, they're on sale. And so they're companies that have a strong, strong fundamental statement but we look at the prices, they're actually on sale relative to their earnings and their cash flow. So that's what's called a, um, a value company. A growth company is ones that are not as concerned about debt. You may have some debt on the books. They're mostly concerned with increasing their top line sales and trying to grow those sales at a faster and faster pace. Or they're involved in what's called disruptive industries or they're a disruptive company that's really an infancy. And so they're trying to get to the point where they can increase their sales rapidly. Think electric vehicles as an example. Uh, a lot of the EV companies, 
they do not have earnings at all, and some of them are still losing large amounts of money every single month. However, there is a shift directionally to disrupt the coal industry and what's being powered as far as our vehicles in the past, uh, gasoline and diesel. And so because of that disruptive industry, and so you're actually saying well, this is a high growth area because it doesn't have a long-term track record. So that's a growth. So some names you may be familiar with in the growth space historically would be like a Microsoft or an Amazon or a um, Datadog or a Snowflake. And so a Facebook in years in the past. Those are companies that historically have grown. Now, some names in there that we like uh, would be like an NVIDIA or an AMD, whose companies really got beat up bad last year. Well, they're starting to show some strong strength because their earnings are still going well. We look big picture that in the economy, why do we look at value companies currently um, versus growth companies in the environment? So we have just come through a high interest rate environment, which we rose interest rates seven times in 2022, looking for an increase again here in the early February or one more in March. So if you're a growth company and you have debt and that interest that you pay on your debts, in most cases, a rising interest rate debt or it's a market based debt then your interest rate has really gone up a lot in the last year. The same way if you have like a home equity loan line of credit there at your bank on your house, your interest rate on your home equity loan probably went up a lot in the last 12 months. It's the same way with the growth companies. Also, whenever you see companies in the high growth industries, whenever we go to a recessionary period of time, or if we're in a period of time when the economy is slowing, then their earnings will have a harder time growing. However, on the value side of companies, they have a strong fortress on their balance sheet, and they've already endured many decades of going through different economic cycles. And so they have the wherewithal and the knowledge of how to navigate it with products that are needed during a recessionary period of time. That's why you're seeing a shifting right now over to value. Um, and then also companies that may be more in the growth space, but the companies themselves are more value oriented. Yeah, and you know we track, John, I don't know the exact number of time I have, but 50, 60 different investment sectors. And these individual funds are fine. They're in value industries. However, they're at the top of our board in terms of their relative strength. So how well they're doing versus the other sectors. And so that's really why when we look at all the fundamental stuff John just walked through, the technicals confirmed us. So that's really where we want to be right now, especially as we move into the rest of this year and we're seeing signs of a upcoming recession or slowdown in the economy it's just prudent to be a little bit patient and make sure that we are uh, in the right areas for the time being but if you haven't done it already we would encourage you to watch the video from your advisor they're going to dive deeper into the specific investments uh, that you now own in your account and they'll provide some more context and data for you as well there and john you know you talked a little bit about passive investing and one of the things we've heard a lot about in the last year uh, is folks saying, hey, my 401k or my 403b, it really took a big hit last year. And that happened in large part because most folks use something called a target date fund. Now, we don't need to dive into it here, but it's a selection of stocks and bonds based upon when you're going to retire. And as you get closer to retirement, your allocations to bonds increases. Well, what happened last year is bonds had one of their worst years in history, coupled with stocks also having one of their worst years in history. And so a lot of folks, because that is a passive strategy, really took it on the chin. And so we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years trying to bring tools and services to our clients to help them manage what is their largest retirement asset, your retirement plan. And so, John, can you just real briefly kind of run through what tools we have available to our clients and what we would encourage folks to do if they have any questions about us helping them in those areas? Right. So with your retirement plans, that's been a, a, something we've heard from all of you. And thank you so much for feedback. Um, over the last couple of years, and even recently, actually yesterday and today, just in conversations with clients about the things that you need to be um, in a more comfortable position as far as from a financial standpoint and realizing your goals. And one of the large things that we're hearing is I'm, I'm really kind of more of a passive investor in my 401k. And so in other words, I buy this particular fund. I let it sit there for 20 to 30 years uh, because there's really no way to manage that. Um, and not quite certain how to place trades as far as the timing of that. And so we actually have spent a, an incredible amount of time and, uh, yeah. and research developing a couple of different ways in which you can have active management inside of your 401k. And uh, there's a couple of different ways we can do that. Um, one is we do have a quarterly subscription model um, in which a one of our partner firms submits out to you every single quarter. 
uh, uh, simply a buy and sell recommendation in for your for your specific 401k plan with your specific investments to you, and then you can go in and place those trades yourself. That is a quarterly basis, so it's not real timely if you're looking for someone to have their eyes as far as what's happening um, on a daily basis. The other two uh, strategies we have now that are available, um, one is with another partner firm of ours called Howard Capital, and uh, they manage about $7 billion right now, and they have done a phenomenal job over the last 30 years in actually developing a tremendous technical analysis and determining when is appropriate times to be in the market and to be out of the market. And they're never going to be able to, you know, the time, they're never going to be able to sell at the absolute high or buy at the absolute bottom. Their objective is really to be within the top 80% on a sell and the top uh, 20% on a buy. And they go in and place trades inside the 401k for you. And uh, so it's a phenomenal resource, a phenomenal tool that we've actually made available. We beta tested it last fall uh, for inside 401ks for a select group of people. And we're making that available now to all of our clients that would like to have more direct oversight with active trades for you inside your 401k. The third option we have is actually with Creekmore Asset Management, um, incorporating your 401k and your retirement plan into your overall investment strategy. Um, as far as using our own investment committee to place trades for you inside your 401k. And in doing so, you can have a, the core funds that you have, or you can have a self-director or brokerage window inside your 401k. And our team is able to go in and place trades on your behalf based upon the goal objectives that you happen to have. And so there's three phenomenal solutions we have for everybody. And it's really a matter of figuring out which one makes the most sense for you looking at your 401k and also looking at your overall retirement plan to see which is the best strategy to utilize in your 401k. Yeah, absolutely. Well said, John. And we'll include a link to a one-page form where we talk a little bit more about each of those three options. Who is, it, is a good fit for is included in that sheet. So you should be able to get a pretty good idea of which options, one or two of them really stood out to you as being appropriate for where you are right now. And what we would encourage you, as always, reach out to your advisor, schedule a 15 minute strategy call, or if we haven't seen you in a number of months, let us know. We'd love to sit down with you in person and talk more about not just the investments for your retirement plans, but also everything going on in your life. And so, John, I think we'll sum it up here mm -hmm. and uh, we are good on my end. Any last words for us? I'll tell you what, a lot of things happened the last three years and uh, we had a big uptick in 20 and then last year was a big downtick overall in the markets and uh, a lot of folks are saying, where am I at right now? That's when you want to get a hold of your advisor and uh, say, hey, let's take my retirement plan to the lab and let's kind of do a deep dive and let's see how we're doing and what changes need to be made if you've not done that already. And when I say take it to the lab, we actually have a new tool called Income Lab. It's providing some phenomenal guidance for our clients to see where you're at even after what the market did last year. A lot of folks are getting a lot of confidence by seeing that and doing a lot of what-if scenarios. So Whenever you're looking at things for your strategy session, make sure that one of the things on there is let's get to the income lab and let's kind of go into some deep dive and make sure the science is all lining up as far as as far as for the retirement income planning in the future. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate each and every one of you. If you have any questions, definitely reach out. Otherwise, we'd love to hear from you and have you sit down with your advisor. So thanks, guys. Have a great week.